was my uh, first year of internship. I was at Nanawading Church and as well as Ringwood. These were the two churches that I was placed at uh, during my internship. And it was probably one of the most interesting year of my ministry life. Well, every year is interesting in its own way. But this particular year, uh, with all of the church visitations that I was involved in, one, there were a couple. It happened to be the year um, that I feel like in reflection uh, was the year of casting out demons. So one of the houses I was called to on my own and I actually went in there to visit one of the young single moms that lived in this house. But when I arrived at the house, she said to me, I'm really glad you're here. And I said, I am glad I'm here as well. And then she said to me, I know that you're here. We have this appointment, but I'm not actually wanting you to spend um, all the time that you need to with me because there's someone else that I need you to visit with. And I said, that's fine. Um, uh, who do I need to visit? Who else is in the house? And so she said to me, oh, my mom really wants to spend some time with you. So I said, oh, that's great. Because I haven't actually spent that much time with her and they don't attend church at all. So they weren't really, it was more of a, um, a visitation because I was requested to go to this house. And she says, oh, my mom wants to um, visit with you. And then I said, okay, that's fine. Where is your mom? And she said to me, uh, she's in her room, okay? And so I expect that she was ill. I didn't ask too many questions. So I went in there and um, this young mom said to me, yeah, she's been, she hasn't been sleeping. And so she just felt like she knew you were coming. And so she wanted you to come and visit with her in her room. Now, a lot of the visitations I do are not usually in people's bedrooms. Let's just be clear. Um, Unless, of course, you are, you know, very, very ill, then, of course, I'll bring someone with me and we will pray with you. So anyhow, I was on my own and the young mum said, oh, I will wait in the bungalow. I'm like, that's fine. And so I make my way uh, through the house into the back room where the, her mum was waiting for me. And uh, I, I get to the room and the door was shut. And so I knocked and she says, come in. I entered and she looked fine. She was standing there and she said to me, I'm glad you're here. I need you to pray with me. I said, excellent. I love praying with people. What would you like me to pray for? And so she said to me, uh, I need you to pray that whoever's in here will leave my room. I said, there's only two of us. And she looked at me in serious, like she was dead serious. And she looked at me and she says, I'm being serious. I need you to pray that whoever is in my room leaves my room. I said, okay. And so uh, I, I did a quick prayer in my head. I said, Lord Jesus, I don't know what's going on, but I need you here with me right now. And so I sat with her um, on the edge of her bed and I said, give me your hand, let's pray. I said, okay, apart from this, is there anything else that you want me to pray for? And she said, nope, just that. And so I sat on the edge of the bed with her. I held her hand and I started to pray. Now I have you, I, you know, this is my first year of internship. I've heard many a story about all sorts of wonderful things that happens. I grew up in Samoa where a lot of superstition is very uh, rife. It, you know, it's part of the, part of the culture, it's, it's everywhere. And so I sat here with this lady and I held her hand stone cold. So I held her and in my head I said, Lord Jesus, I have no idea what I'm doing, but scripture tells me that I need to pray in your name. And I've, I've learned this, in my head I've learned this. And now I actually need to apply this. And so I held her hand and I started to pray, you know, and I haven't even finished my first sentence. This is a grown woman. I haven't finished my first sentence. And so she started doing somersaults while I'm holding her hand. And I was on my own in this room. And so this woman is almost getting me off my seat. And I said, Lord Jesus, I need you to keep me grounded. I need you to have me seated in this bed and I need you to be with me in my head. So I, I'm just praying. I said, Lord Jesus, there are many stories in the Bible where it says that through your name that you yourself have spoken and the demons have actually obeyed and she's doing somersaults on this bed. You know, I'm an intern. 
scared out of my mind. And so I keep praying. And then she gets herself right in front of me. She looks at me and started hissing at me and hissing. And in that very moment, I was staring the fallen angels in the face because the hissing kept going. And I am praying in the name of Jesus and hissing at me. And I said, in the name of Jesus. And I am feeling rather insecure and scared because here is a pastor who has learned about faith and the power of the name of Jesus. I have seen Jesus at work in so many circumstances and here I am faced with it. And I needed to call on the miracles of Jesus. I needed to call on the faith of Jesus. I needed to call on the history and everything that I needed to know and everything that I've grown up to know in the Adventist church. I needed to call on that and my intellect went out the window and I'm staring this thing in the face. And I said, in the name of Jesus, you leave this woman. And she falls on her knees, collapses and her head falls on my lap. And I am now holding her and I am praying over her and I am praising Jesus in this room. And I am singing hallelujah, Jesus. My heart is pounding and I am shaking like I am right now. And in that very moment, I saw God at work. I've seen God at work in so many different circumstances. But I saw God at work before my eyes. I couldn't give it give credit anywhere else but the power of Jesus was at work. Was that a miracle? Yes, it was. Did it have anything to do with my faith? No, because <laughs> I was scared witless. You know, the last couple of weeks, we have been talking about the teachings of Jesus by the Sea of Galilee. The first week we talked about the call. And you know, in, as I was reflecting on this whole series, that story that I have just shared with you, I had to recall my own calling. You know, I stared my calling in the face. And uh, we have been studying the book of Mark in our Wednesday night prayer meeting. And it's interesting that when you go to the calling of the disciples, you know, part of the things that Jesus actually called them to do was to cast out demons and bring healing. I don't know if you read that. And I know my calling in Jesus. And I say, hallelujah, Jesus, thank you. And in that moment, as I am praying my heart out, scared and insecure and thinking about the fact that I am such a sinner, I have no right to be casting out anything. And this is going on in my head and Jesus was at work. And I had to recall my calling and Lorinda called or uh, shared her calling a few weeks ago and, and how God has called her into teaching ministry and talked about the concept of being called and the teachings of Jesus by the sea as He called people to follow Him. Last week, we had Anthony that captured the teachings of Jesus and all of the miracles of Jesus. Today, we're going to talk about faith and all of these go hand in hand and they're difficult topics. They aren't that easy to unpack. Let me just be clear about that because we live in a very uh, intellectual society and in this church, we over intellectualize a lot of things. So issues like miracles, uh, we can, can actually put out there and say, yes, we do believe it, but then we try and intellectualize it to the point where sometimes we talk ourselves out of it of the miracles of Jesus. Do they exist? Yes, they do. Is He still making miracles and creating miracles today? Yes, He is. Praise Jesus. Yes, He is. But then comes the whole aspect of faith. And I go back to my story. As I was sitting there, I, you know, I can't intellectually or intelligently or even clearly, coherently tell you where my faith was actually at as I am praying for this lady. I don't know where my faith was at. I actually had to just claim all of the knowledge that I knew and the scripture that I have grown up to learn and the stories of Jesus. Is that part of my faith? Yes. Just claiming that it had to be, but it had to be 
Jesus and the miracles and I, I actually had to pray for a miracle. Now, did that actually need to happen for me to solidify my call and solidify uh, the ministry that God has called me into? Partly. But that needed to take place for this lady. She needed freedom. She needed freedom. Has she been to church since? No. But God needed to create that anyway and allowed me to witness that. So today we're going to go to a story. Um, there's a couple of stories. So I want you to get your Bibles out or whatever device you got uh, because it's, in, it's important that we go to Scripture with this idea. And we've got a few minutes to unpack this story, but also we've got a few questions to wrestle with, with the whole idea of faith, but as I was sharing with someone, um, I have been struggling with this topic. I've been wrestling with this topic this week um, because of, not because of faith itself, but where doubt actually comes in. Where does, you know, um, does it have room? You know, with the whole idea of faith, do we allow room for doubt and questions? As you have come to faith, what's your journey been like? So I want to just leave those questions for you just to ponder upon. What's your journey of faith been like? Uh, where, what has doubt played in your journey of faith or questioning if you don't like the word doubt? But let's go to the book of Mark. Father God, as we open Scripture I want to thank you that you are our God and I want to thank you that you are a God that shows and reveal yourself through your word. And I thank you for the miracles um, that you have actually shared with us in this. And with, as we unpack the story of Jairus and his daughter and the woman, um, I pray, Father, in the, in the name of Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit that leads us into truth, that you will open our hearts, our minds to these stories. Thank you for leading us right now. Amen. So I am reading from the New International Version. And we start this story from verse 21 of Mark chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, please read with, with me. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet um, and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realised that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around him. You, his disciples asked, answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all the commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. 
but they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha ku'um, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So I would imagine that most of us have probably heard this story. For those of you who are here for the very first time, welcome. And welcome to the presence of Jesus. And as we share this story, I pray uh, that you will get a glimpse of Him. So here's a story that we have come to know over for those of you and I that have grown up learning about this. Jesus in the previous passage uh, in the beginning of chapter 5, had returned from Gerasene. So Gerasene is a, a Gentile decopolis. So it is a town of Gentiles. And we all know the story, or most of us probably know this story, where Jesus had gone there to have a bit of retreat. He was crowded by people, and you read that in the first four chapter, chapters of Mark as, and, and all the other gospel writers. So he, went, he goes across to the Gerasenes, and when he gets there, uh, the very first thing that he finds a Jesus or first person is a demon possessed man. Okay, so Jesus releases this man from being demon possessed and then makes their way back to the west side of the Galilee. And here we have this story. Here's one of the things that with regards to the first uh, story in chapter five, when Jesus healed and freed the, de the demon-possessed man, he actually tells him to go back home and tell his family. In this story, it's a different one. This is consistent with all the other instructions that Jesus had been giving the people that he has healed in the beginning of his ministry. We have to keep in mind that when Jesus came and showed up to start his ministry, he says, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is near this is one of the stories and parables that, or, that Jesus actually is telling as He unpacks what it means to have the kingdom of God be near and here. One of the stories. And so we have this, for most of the stories that we have read so far, the synagogue rulers have been the one that have stood amongst the crowd, judging and opposing the things that Jesus is doing, the miracles that He's making and creating, the healing that He's performing. But here is a story of one of the rulers, one of probably very few rulers that we know of, that have actually come to be at the feet of Jesus, asking Jesus for help. So Jairus is a synagogue ruler who fought the crowd to get to Jesus and asking Jesus to heal his daughter that was sick. So keep that in. The daughter is sick. But the story tells us that as Jesus and Jairus and the whole of the crowd that have followed Jesus are making their way to Jairus' house to see this little girl, a woman, as we have been told, presses in amongst the crowd, fights through the crowd and gets to Jesus. And she has a conversation in her head. And it says this, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Verse 25 of chapter 5 of Mark. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She has suffered a great deal under the care of many doctor, doctors and has spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. In another, um, in other of the gospel writers, it kind of gives you this internal conversation that this woman is having with herself. If only, I, if only, if even if I don't get to face Jesus, but touch a part of his cloak. Now, here's um, one of the things that we've got to sort of. We've read this story. We've heard about it. We know that when she touched Jesus. Um, 
she was healed. And we'll come to that part. I don't know how often you sit with some of these stories and try and put yourself in her place. This is a very long time of menstruating. For the women amongst us, you know, three days, well, actually one day is enough. Enough. Uh, I know that for the men and for those of you who are in a male dominant home, uh, I do apologise, but I'm not really sorry, not sorry. Okay, so this is a very human issue, very woman human issue. One day for a woman is enough, you know, and some women suffer it a lot more than others. Some faint, some can't even get to work. That's how serious it is. And it's very possible that this lady would have done that. My sister has four boys. And so recently she has had to tell the boys, uh, why mummy is cranky a cer like at certain times of the month. And so now they understand apparently, although Johnny being Johnny has said, so are you cranky all the time then? <laughs> Does that mean mum that you're bleeding all month, every month? But this is a fairly um, significant thing. So yes, yeah, there is hormones that play into that, but we won't use that as an excuse, right ladies? Mm-mm. She has been bleeding for 12 years and she has gone from one doctor to another. Now, we also need to keep in mind, uh, some have suggested that in chapter 5 of Mark, these stories have to do with ceremonial uncleanliness. And so this woman and her state fits in that. We've got to understand that when a woman is menstruating, she actually has to leave her town, her home and go out the gate. Okay. And so imagine bleeding for 12 years. She has been, not been a part of a community and family gathering celebrations for that long. It could, I mean, if you use what actually happens in a culture, she has gotten to a point of desperation. Absolute desperation. Now, one could ask, and there are a few, few questions that we've got to ask of the text. How does she know Jesus was in town? How does she know that this Jesus can actually be the kind of doctor that she need? Did she actually believe that Jesus could heal her? The text suggests that for her to go to Jesus, even if just to touch a part of his you know, garment would heal her. So there's an element and level of belief that she had. But could it be that she was so desperate, so, so desperate, she spent all her finances with the doctors of the town, the top Jewish doctors of the town, mind you, their remedies could probably only, would be given to only the clean because she's unclean. So when she goes to the doctors, they'll probably go, well, hello, you need to actually be outside the gate because you're unclean. And these are some of the things we've got to keep in mind when we read this story. Could it be that when she approached the physicians of the day, they considered her so unclean that they couldn't even give her what she needed? And so her level of desperation led her to press into or be amongst the crowd. Now, also, once again, she's unclean. It took her a bit of courage. And, I, and I've questioned this. Was it courage or was it desperation that got her there? You know, she knows well and truly that if people knew she was unclean, they would not allow her to be amongst them. So either she kept herself so well hygiened that they wouldn't have known or she did not care. She just had to get to Jesus. And her desperation of belief got her to Jesus. And in our text, it says that when she got to Jesus, she pressed and fought the crowd to get to Him, pushing and shoving. And here's the crowd that's, you know, and the text says that they pressed into Jesus, but somehow, some way, she found herself touching a part of his cloak. Here's some interesting things that we've got to take out of this passage. It says, verse 30, well, actually, go back to verse 28, 29. Um, 
27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Amazing belief. Immediately, and this is very consistent of Mark and the way that he writes. Um, he's very quick to action. He doesn't want to waste time. Immediately, Mark says, her bleeding stopped and she felt her body that she was freed from her suffering. The, the word freed here um, tells us a, a spirit of liberation and a relief that actually has lifted from her. But verse 30 tells us um, something a little bit more interesting and powerful with regards to this story. At once, Jesus realised that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? The word power, another version actually says virtue, that virtue left Jesus. Uh, virtue and the word power, um, in, the, in the Greek it says dunamis. The word dunamis, um, you probably can translate translate that quite well, um, is the word dynamic. It is so powerful, the force that actually left Jesus. The word dunamis, just, just saying that. I, um, I once heard a speaker that, that used this word and, and um, you know, the same power is the power of the Holy Spirit and it's attributed to the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's ju not just any power that has left Jesus and, and healed this lady it is the supernatural power of God that actually has come and healed her. And Jesus felt it. It was dunamis power. It's not just any kind of power. It was the power that comes from the only source that can give power. And that is God Himself. And everyone says, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. The power of Jesus. Dunamis power. Dunamis power, dynamic power, not just any power, but dynamic power, a virtue left Jesus. Holy Spirit, dynamic power left Jesus and healed her and freed her. Now, interestingly enough, when you look at the text, it says that it wasn't just the physical healing. And this is, this is the power that left Jesus. Yeah. The power that left Jesus not only healed her physically, but freed her to be saved. And this is the kind of thing like when we talk about the whole freeing of her, she's freed. Um, it says that she actually experienced salvation as well. Imagine her desperation to be physically healed, but not realising that as she is so desperate to touch Jesus and her beliefs led her there, that Jesus looked after her whole being and not just this bleeding that needed to stop. And everyone says, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. The dynamic power of Jesus left him, healed her all over, all over inside and out. Love it. So Jesus was detoured by this because he was making his way to the house of Jairus. And so the story tells us that as he um, is confronted with her, um, and again, you know, I, I imagine this, she would have been embarrassed to tell the truth, but you know what? She's freed. She's liberated. What has she got to lose now? She is freed from this bleeding. And so as much as she was scared to come forward to say, hey, Jesus, it was me. Her liberation gave her boldness to come before the king and said, hey, it was me. It was me that actually touched you. And so not only, and this is one of the most beautiful thing where Jesus now, not only did she come and try to sneak in, but yet it was such a powerful um, dynamic power that left Jesus and healed her immediately. Um, Jesus is now face to face with her. And then He speaks into her life and says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. I love that um, she has not had peace for 12 years. I don't know if you've ever lacked peace. It is the most uncomfortable state of being to ever be in. We need Jesus. 
when we're in that state. I tell you what, we need Jesus. And here Jesus gave this peace to this lady and go, go in peace. Go in the assurance that you have been saved be at peace. Go in the assurance that you have been healed from the inside out. Go in peace. Who needs peace today? Oh, yes. Yes, we need peace. And we need Jesus to look us in the face and say, hey, go in peace. Be at peace. And we say, thank you, Jesus. So I would have imagined, or I do imagine, that she would have been so amazed at that, that she ran. Or I don't know what she would have done, probably followed him, but just be so excited that for 12 years, it's now been lifted from her. And so we keep going with our story. And it says here, so he's done that with her, but while he is still speaking, um, some of the messengers come from Jairus' house and tells Jairus. Jairus actually went to Jesus, said, Jesus, my, my daughter is sick. In Matthew, actually, he, he bypasses the fact that the daughter is sick um, and says she died. But Mark wants to actually give us this background. He says she was sick, but while Jesus was attending to this lady, his daughter dies. And so the messengers come to him and, and says, Jairus, your daughter is has died. And so here it says, ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid and just believe. So they went to the house and he only took his disciples in with him. Um, they've already hired the whalers because that is what they did in the time when someone passes the way. You have professional whalers and mourners. Um, imagine that for a job. What's your career path? Well, I'm a professional mourner. Some of us probably mourn and we're not even paid for it. Um, so they have this commotion of wailers and mourners. And Jesus comes at them and tells them, well, she's not dead, she's asleep, as we read this in the story. And he put them all out. So he invites them to go and wait outside. And he takes his disciples in with him. And then he says to this girl as he comes to her bed, bedside and he says and Mark apparently is the only one that has quoted Jesus um, in the language that he would have used of the time Aramaic and he says Talitha Ka'um little girl I say to you get up immediately as Mark loves the immediate action the girl stood up and walked around and she was 12 interesting points just to notice here and then we've got some questions to wrestle with In the face-to-face -face conversation that Jesus had with the woman that has been suffering with bleeding for 12 years, he refers to her as daughter. The same kind of language is also used here when he calls this girl. The word little girl or Talitha Ka'um um, also means a maiden or a daughter. So same reference given to both um, of these girls. Interestingly enough, we say it's little girl and the woman and Jairus is the one that's being named. I don't know if you've picked that up, but anyway, the woman has no name, neither does the daughter, just little girl. Um, but the, the language is used and the reference that Jesus actually uses for both um, of these girls is daughter, you know, or maiden. The little girl, get up and walk. And so she does. Another one that's really interesting, and Mark's act Mark actually puts this here, um, she is 12 years old. Some theologians have said, you know, with regards and why has Mark put these stories together and also the other gospel writers, it would assume that the woman that Jesus has just healed, as soon as she started menstruating, so... Uh, I would imagine that she would probably be about in her mid 20s, about 20, like the year 12, roughly 11, 12 is when girls start their menstrual cycle. Uh, and so I guess the writers is trying to say to us, you know, this girl for all of her marriageable life, this woman has been bleeding. So, you know, that gives you another aspect of the kind of life that she would live. Who wanted her? She was unclean. And here is this little girl who's just turned 12 and Jesus has actually brought her back to life. 
and she is in that marriageable age. An interesting point, just with regards to the stories that we have. Two stories. One of the story tells of one individual that pursued Jesus with all that she had. The second story um, is another that has pursued Jesus, not with regards to himself, although it is indirectly to do with him, but on behalf of somebody else. Whose faith is greater? Does it matter? Not really. Either way, the story suggests that because they believed Jesus healed. Now, here are some questions I want to I want to give you, and then I hope that you can go and wrestle with them and 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 discuss them over lunch because uh, our time is is running out. So, here are a couple of questions, and you know, in our Sabbath school lesson, we talked about faith and not not doubt. Okay, so this is why I've been wrestling with this topic because it's very easy for me to stand up here and say to you, believe, and you will be healed. Now, a lot of you will go, go jump because I believe and God hasn't healed me. I believe with all my heart and God hasn't healed me. So I want to acknowledge that this is not an easy topic and I cannot um, do justice to this topic and stand here and say to you, go in peace, be healed. And I have faith that God has the power to do that. I also acknowledge that some of you have probably been fasting and praying and fasting and praying for that kind of healing, whatever it is that you're needing. um, And you have begged Jesus in your desperation, you've gone to Jesus with all the faith that you could muster up. I acknowledge this and yet God hasn't healed you. So I acknowledge that this topic and this story is amazing and I want this to happen, but I want to acknowledge that God hasn't healed all of us in the way that we want Him to. And does that matter? Yes, it matters. Yes, it matters. And so here here are some questions for you. Why is faith so important in this journey that we're on? And why does the Bible make such a big deal about faith? Why does the Bible make such a big deal? I mean, you know, you go to the book of Hebrews and it tells us that faith, you know, you know the explanation, you've debated it in Sabbath school, you know, that that faith is this thing that we put out of there. Interestingly enough, I am... You know, when I look at this, I just go, oh, faith. It says Hebrews 11, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone that comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. In Matthew, in our Sabbath school today, it says that when you believe, and if you believe without doubt, you can tell the mountain and go throw itself to the sea. You know those ones. In James, it says, believe and have no doubt. And then I read Psalm, Psalm 22 and goes, God, why have you forsaken me? That's probably more the normal reaction. And yet I'll come to you and say, believe and have no doubt. Why is the Bible making such a big deal about faith? You know, it's interesting. um, Some very smart people that we, uh, quite a lot of us read probably, C.S. Lewis being one, um, you know, Yancey being one, Spurgeon being another, Calvin, um, amazing people, pillars that we look at to have had the most incredible faith. But yet, the stories we don't hear or don't read often is moments when they have doubted. You know, one of the stories that I love of Lewis, um, you know, there's a story of him where he gathers. He had this debating club where they gathered, um, I think they call it the Socratic debating club or something, and he was able to debate anyone out of the room, you know? And then he come, came up against one um, opponent, and she was a Catholic um, uh, scholar. And, and they debated and debated and debated, and it was on the issue of faith, you know? And she basically debated him out of his own argument, and he went into such a despair. And one of the things that I really love, and this is the whole idea of faith, uh, and that is sometimes we use it, um, uh, we, we sometimes use it as, uh, 
how do I put it, that we over intellectualize it and therefore it doesn't become faith. And I think that's the problem that Lewis had, that he wanted to debate himself into faith. And so one of the, um, one of the, the, the quotes that I want to read from it is uh, here. Faith in the sense in which I am here using the word is the art of holding on to things your reason has once accepted in spite of your changing moods. And so, um, and then it goes, that is why faith is such a necessary virtue. Unless you teach your moods where they get off, you can never be either a sound Christian or even a sound atheist. And then uh, further down, he actually says that we, 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 we debate ourselves into this whole whole idea of, of faith um, that sometimes we end up falling apart and one of the quotes and I, I am not going to be able to paraphrase it properly but he says that we fall apart and we need to fall into Christ who is the source of faith because for him intelligent amazing scholar and a theologian at that. And I guess for him, his struggle was that, yes, acknowledging doubt, yes, acknowledging this struggle, but the mere fact is that he has tried to carry that faith. Now, do, is it important? Um, and there are two questions. We often say, well, I think it's because we've depended too much, our faith has depended too much on how we feel. Does emotion play into our faith? There's elements of it. But here it says, well, you know, if our faith is dependent on our mood, well, our mood changes all the time. Speaking of women who are at certain times, that's a lot of months to change your faith in accordance with your mood. So where do we get off with faith? And what room does doubt have with this whole idea of faith? Is it a stepping stone or a stumbling block? Because we read this story and we don't hear the part where this woman would have doubted whether Jesus could actually heal him. We only hear that she pursued Jesus amidst the crowd, knowing the history that she has had with physicians. Jairus heard his daughter had died while he and Jesus were making their way to his house. Now, did Jesus read that in a moment, a flinching moment, Jairus would have said, oh, well, she's gone now. Jesus can't heal her. And Jesus read that and says, ruler, Jairus, just believe. Was there a moment and is there room for us to question? Interestingly enough, um, you know, Philip Yancey in one of his interviews with this whole idea of doubt, he grew up in a church where there was no room given for people to question. And he grew up very disillusioned. And one of the things that he says is that we can talk about faith and there is an element of faith and it's what we need at the end of the day without faith. Where would we be? But one of the things that he challenges is is that be okay with questioning. And I shared with last night with our open house crew. We've got to remember that God is doubt tolerant. I love that little phrase. Or question tolerant. God has lived with this his whole entire existence of the earth and humanity. So he can deal with your questions and your doubts. But then he goes on to say, you know, allow yourself a space. And so I hope that you feel that you are safe enough in this space to question if you are in that part of your journey of faith. But here's another challenge that Yancy goes on to say, and he says, get yourself in amongst a safe place where you can question and challenge your doubts and your questions. But at the same time, question your doubts and question your questions. Rather than getting amongst the doubters and just go on with this whole doubting idea, what if we get amongst a safe group of us and say, hey, I am questioning these things. I have prayed, I have fasted, but nothing has happened. I've prayed and I've fasted for that person, nothing has happened. How can, we, can you help me with this process? Because at the end of the, the day, faith remains and we fall into Jesus. And that is, I hope, the place we end up. 
I hope that's the place. Here's another question, and I know I see John, and we're going to be finishing up. One of the, one of the other questions I want to leave with you as you, um, how do we get there? One of the ladies, her name is, she's a famous novelist, um, Anne Lamott, uh, and the question is, how do you get to this idea of faith? And her experience is, she said, you know, I am, um, and I want to read it so I get it properly. My coming to faith did not start with a leap, but rather a series of staggers from what seemed like one safe place to another. Like lily pads round and green, these places summoned and then held me up while I grew. Each prepared me for the next leaf on which I would land. And in this way, I moved across, across the swamp of doubt and fear. Some of us are probably staggering to this place of faith. And you're just taking one step to that one lily pad to the other and eventually we'll get across the swamp but some of us will probably spend a bit of time in the swamp of faith and you know what that is okay if that is where you are at it's okay my prayer is this that we as a community by God's grace will provide for you lily pads that you can hop on lily pads where you can step into a feeling safe enough in this swamp of faith I pray that that be your experience. One last question. Does having faith really change the outcomes of life? So the first question is, what's the big deal with faith? And do we leave room for questioning and doubts? And is it okay? Is God okay with that? I'd say yes. Secondly, how do we get to this place of having the kind of faith that this woman had as well as a gyrus for others. And thirdly, does having faith really change the outcome of life and the outcomes of life? My immediate answer is yes, but there is some unpacking of that that needs to be done. And the unpacking of it needs to be done in a safe environment. And like I said before, I pray that we can provide that safe environment where we can talk about what has been the outcome. And here's one of the things I always love, and as I I wrap up, we ask the question of each other, how has God been showing up in your life? Or at least I ask that question. Because when we reflect upon that, um, it actually challenges where, uh, you know, our journey of faith, but also our expectant Um, of God's showing up and has our faith actually changed that and I would say yes immediate reaction is yes wholeheartedly yes faith changes the outcomes of life and what does that look like for you I hope that you can share that over um, lunch as we unpack so we have these stories two people pursued faith and pursued Jesus in amidst the crowd, in amidst their doubts and unsure whether this is going to work, but they pursued it anyway. So my prayer for us is that we pursue and continue to be persistent with faith, even amongst our questionings, even amongst the noise, even amongst the crowd, we persist with it because we can only land at Jesus.